I'd like us all to start with a moment of silence for those who have passed and those who are suffering and those who have suffered from the war on drugs. Thank you. I want to start this transition by saying that the war on drugs is a war on healing. And that the structures that have been created that we are working with, for, and often against are ones that were created by people. People in many ways different from us, but in many ways just like us. My name is Ismail Ali, and I was asked to be part of this amazing conversation with these amazing peers of mine to talk about the system, the ones that we're working with, the ones that we're hoping to create, and what the tension is between those things. This topic is about psychedelic advocacy, but advocacy is not an end goal by itself. It's the means to a goal. It's the means to an outcome. And I hope that for the next 55 minutes or so, we're able to discuss what that outcome might look like through the perspectives of the people on this panel. The fundamental principle of safe access is not only ensuring that people have medicine, medicine and healing and treatment in the way that was so effectively described in the last panel, but it's also to protect people, sure, from criminal enterprise, but also from law enforcement and from the structure that keeps those people away from that healing. Right now, we criminalize the seeking of that healing. And that criminalization, that system, is the one we're working within for most of us, not all of us, but for many of us. And those systems, at this time, fundamentally victimize users of drugs. They fundamentally victimize people who are seeking healing. Maybe they have victimized you. Maybe you have known people who have been in this position. It has affected all of us, and I believe it is something that is important to all of us. So to start, I would like to ask our panel members to share a brief bio. I have a problem with the word bio because I think it's very impersonal. My name did this, this, and this. I want our panelists to share some sort of hybrid. We've been thinking a lot about hybrids in the space lately of your bio and your story. What is it about your experience, your identity, or something that has happened that has brought you to this conversation? Because once we're grounded with that, then we can talk about what we're actually trying to do. So, um, <coughs> yes, yeah, psychedelics have been important in my, in my life. Um, once upon a time, I was a chemical engineer, and then I did ayahuasca. So that led me on a journey that uh, changed the trajectory of my life. Can you, can you still hear me? Okay? All right, good. Um, I took a one-way flight uh, to India, did a backpacking journey for uh, about 15 months. So I changed the trajectory of my own life um, from one where I was seeking uh, initially a career and money and all of those things that are traditionally known to be what success is. Um, and when I came back from this uh, backpacking journey, I decided to devote myself. Um, I didn't think it was right that this very life-changing experience that I had, um, where psychedelics had impacted my life in a positive way, got me more in tune with my own truth. That was something I was told to be ashamed about. Uh, I was told that uh, I couldn't talk about this. I wanted to live in a world where people can talk more openly and honestly about their experiences with psychedelics or any other psychoactives for that matter. Uh, and that has led me on my current journey with Symposia and now with Crypto Psychedelic. Good afternoon. I'm Betty Aldworth, the Executive Director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. And... <laughs> Um, I am almost certainly the least psychedelic person here today, um, but I am entirely, utterly, and completely dedicated to the notion of changing everything about the way we think about, treat, interact with uh, drugs and the people who use them. 
Um, I'm here to empty prisons, at, you know, first and foremost. Yep. And um, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you all about how, how psychedelic advocacy fits in with all of that. Um, as to how I got here, I've been an activist as long as I can remember. I went to my first march before I could walk. Um, and in my very early years, I was involved in a couple of big wins with um, uh, against apartheid and nuclear armaments. Now, when I say involved with, what I mean is I wrote some letters. <coughs> I went to some protests. But I got hooked on the idea that we can change the world when I was very young, and I've spent my entire life trying to do so. Um, that led me to be the spokesperson for the Amendment 64 campaign, where I also had the privilege of leading the field um, in Colorado what, when we legalized marijuana and brought me... <laughs> and that ultimately brought me to SSDP, where now I have the... Ex extraordinary honor of <clears throat> uh, guiding, coaching, and supporting 5,000 students on 300 campuses in 28 countries who are all fighting to end the war on drugs. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ife Tayo Harvey. I am the Communications Associate at the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, I'm based in New York City. And oh, thank you. Uh, I've been with DPA for about two years now. Um, before that, I interned with them, and I also have worked with uh, the Art View Group and MAPS. So yeah, I've been in drug policy for about five or six years now. Um, how did I get here? What's my connection to drug policy? So let's see. The drug war has affected me in a lot of ways, right? So I started working with DPA in 2012, and I published a piece and spoke about my experience having a parent incarcerated. So my father is a, or was a Jamaican immigrant to the United States. He immigrated as a migrant worker, and he later got involved with uh, drugs and selling drugs. And so my father was convicted of a drug charge and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Um, he was released early after eight years and deported. So that's kind of my place in drug policy and talking about how these uh, harmful punitive policies hurt our communities, they hurt our families and individuals. So, and especially the children, children like me who didn't have a chance to form a real relationship with our parents and our loved ones. Um, yeah, so that's me. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Oriana Mayorga. I am a community organizer for an organization called Citizen Action. Um, it's a statewide organization in New York and um, I am trying to do a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I am trying to uh, dismantle racism and build power in my community by making sure that the people who are most impacted um, are, you know, have a seat at the table. Um, and I'm also trying to revolutionize electoral politics. I'm running our endorsement process for the congressional race in my area. Um, it's very important that we turn that blue. Um, and that is the work that I'm doing right now. I have been in this world for seven years, um, since I was 19, uh, interning at various places, working on the you know drug policy end, but then um, always coming back to my roots, which is my first love. And um, it's MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And as a survivor of sexual assault, um, it like it healed me, um, and it was a medicine. It is it is a medicine that I um, I adore and I want to advocate for it. But I want to make sure that when I'm advocating for it, um, I'm making sure that those like myself who look like me who've experienced this trauma also have access to this medicine, not just us who are in Tulum. And um, it's really important, I think, for for me to um, be militant about that advocacy and speak up about it, um, because we want to provide healing for everybody, right? And so that's the work that I do, that's how I got here. Um, and I, I wouldn't be here without uh, the support of Benoit and a few others, um, Symposia, who you know have encouraged me to keep doing this work, even though I've taken a step back uh, from the scene for a little bit. Okay, hello, so my name is Bruno Gonzalez. Um, 
thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I am, I would say, a drug enthusiast, so I do love drugs, all drugs. Um, <laughs> I was, I guess, hooked on heroin since I was 13, so for seven, eight years I was hooked on heroin. I injured my arm in my last overdose, so that's how I stopped using heroin, but then after that I kind of reconnected with LSD and ayahuasca, and so that kind of uh, helped a little bit to refocus uh, the efforts I was having. Um, and I got engaged with harm reduction, so since 2009 I've been involved with harm reduction programs in Mexico City, uh, focusing mainly on non-injected drug use, so it's like expanding a little bit harm reduction interventions. Uh, right now we run a substance analysis service, so like checking drugs at festivals and then fixed locations every now and then to try to identify uh, new psychoactive substances, adulterant substituted agents. Uh, and try to prevent tragedies by the use of substances while we run an um, uh, advocacy uh, drug policy program uh, to try to end the war on drugs, right? So the main objective of everything we do is try to have conversations about drugs, all drugs, so not just psychedelics. It's about uh, the universe of drugs. If you're curious, there's a poster up here. It's free to take if you want. Um, but it's understanding that plants and psychoactive substances have been present before there were humans, before there was any language, before there was any code of law, before there was anything. They have been here. We have been engaging and interacting with those experiences, not just psychedelic experiences, but the conversations with the plants and the compounds and the molecules. So th those conversations are kind of fundamental to our existence as human beings. And going back to that, understanding the impacts of the war on drugs, understanding violence, uh, war economy, and what we live here in Mexico in a narco state where you know the cartels run politics and they run the infrastructure and the economy and allow these spaces to have uh, permissive, tolerant uh, policies about, for example, smoking cannabis or selling cannabis or doing all sorts of drugs in the beach as tourists. Uh, in a country where 200,000 people have died out of this uh, confrontation. Um, so then psychedelics just helped me to realize that learning about this, learning about the historical process, about why drugs are illegal, and uh, seeing what is happening around us is a nice way to find uh, you know, more peaceful, harmonious uh, policies and ways to engage and interact with each other. Thank you all Woo. for sharing all of that. Um, and I guess I'll share a little bit about myself. My name, as I mentioned earlier, is Ismail Ali. I'm the, I currently work as policy and advocacy counsel at MAPS, um, where I do legal policy regulatory work, uh, hopefully you know, beginning the process of setting the, the infrastructure for this longer term vision that we're talking about. Um, I also serve as the vice chair of the board of directors of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which is an awesome organization doing incredible work and in organizing students around the world, literally on every continent now. Um, to engage in this conversation. And I guess that's a good segue into kind of like what brought me here and what I'm doing here. Um, I've been kind of, I've had a relationship with uh, psychoactive substances from psychedelics to a lot of others um, for well over a decade and I've worked with psychedelics in ceremonial and recreational and therapeutic contexts and I've um, had the p blessing and privilege to have had them work directly on me in a lot of ways, and I've been able to share that uh, with people, and I've, I have the, the privilege of being educated, of being in a position where I can share, share my experience um, of being like a young Muslim in the post-9-11 world and experiencing the dissonance um, of growing, growing up with this, with this lack of understanding around how the military-industrial complex interfaced with the prison industry, interfaced with civil liberties and the curtailment over time, and how all these things were actually related. And being able to share that experience of like kind of the, the beam of light that my first psilocybin experience was able to show me through that dissonance and into something a little bit more visionary um, is something that I have a tremendous privilege to be able to share. And part of, I think, this conversation is bringing in structures and safe spaces, whether they're literally safe um, or they're conceptually safe for us to be having these discussions so we can begin to help other people who haven't come out yet feel safe to come out and be part of this conversation. Um, there were a lot of amazing single one-liner and quotes from that last panel. I don't know if you guys were all listening carefully, but there was amazing, amazing information shared, and I wish I could just share all of them. But I want to start with um, one that I think will help set up this conversation around barriers. Catherine mentioned that there are three primary barriers, which I think is very accurate, around 
this long-term conversation, one being legality, which we'll get to in a second, one being public funding and public recognition of the value of these substances, and one which is related to that, which is the stigma that's still associated with them. And I want to add one that kind of fits in between these uh, that I would call false boundaries. And I think that one of the things that we have to be thinking about when we're thinking about what policy, what policies, what structures, what systems we want to put in place in the longer term, what that end goal is, is what exactly we're trying to build in here. And if you notice, in the last panel, there was a little bit of a tension because we're talking about healing, we're talking about therapy, but we're also talking about spirituality. Mm. And I think that boundary, that false boundary, is one that <coughs> literally exists within the American legal system. In the United States, you can go through the church system and show that you're a religious practice. You can go through the FDA and show that it's medically valuable. Or you can decriminalize everything and remove the penalties and see what people do. I think that there's something in between here that we're trying to create between those polarities that we have an opportunity to take. So I want to ask the panel if you, and this is kind of in line with the, the question that Catherine asked at the end of her panel, which I thought was brilliant. If you could do anything, like what are we fighting for? What's going on here? What's the long-term vision? And what are your ideas for what we're trying to make happen? Hmm. I also actually really quickly want to make this conversation. So people will be interrupting each other. It's cool. We've already agreed. So if you see it, we're good. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll riff off of some things that were said in the last panel. Um, and Catherine and others pointed out there is we want to, I think people need to have access to uh, using these substances in the way that they want to use them. So, so for some people, yes, that's the FDA approved container where you feel comfortable. For some people, that's the jungle. For some people, it's Catherine's farm. And I think uh, <laughs> people need to have uh, the autonomy to make those choices for themselves. And I would like to see our <coughs> regulatory uh, mindset kind of flipped on its head. Rather than telling people this is what you can't do if you cross this boundary you're gonna be punished. We should be encouraging people about what the safe ways and the best benefit maximized ways to do things are. And when I think about um, you know, what it is, my, my vision, right? So what is it that I see? Um, I wanna see um, myself at this conference every single year. Like I wanna see all of us present and part of the conversation. I wanna make sure that people that look like me um, are able to also have um, a voice in the policies that are being made, which impact, or, you know, directly impact us. Um, and I, I want to make sure that in my world, if I had a million dollars, I need, I need more than a million. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, some sort of leadership, tr some training, some leadership development that's intentional, right? That is about creating leaders in these spaces that are often not occupied by minority and disenfranchised groups, so that they are having a voice in this process. Um, I think we're really special. I think the psychedelic community is so special. We can do so much good, and it's about really setting the intention and being accountable to what are the structures, like you know, Izzy said, that we are setting up, and what are the structures that you know need to be dismantled. Um, and so, in my world, you know, I I, uh, I want to train women uh, and men and and uh, people that don't have access to this um, so that they they can. For me, the first step is decriminalization of all drugs. Here, um, here. I, I think that we have some interesting dialogues happening, particularly in the US right now, around legalization of individual drugs and, and um, medicalization of uh, MDMA and, and others. But ultimately, we have to remove the threat of criminalization from drug use first before we're going to be able to truly open up the spiritual um, and psychological opportunities to all communities. We have to remove the fear that uh, drug use um, might lead to decades behind bars mm -hmm. and really shift the way that, that we're thinking about drugs in general. Um, and until we're able to decriminalize not just those drugs that we think of as good, but also those which are highly stigmatized, heroin, uh, methamphetamine, and others, <clears throat> so that people, regardless of the drug that they are using, are able to access the treatment opportunities and the modalities that we're promising here, um, are able to do so without fear. I agree with that. Yeah, I want to add on um, decriminalization before legalization or with legalization. 
uh, because we can have legalization, but that doesn't repair the harms that the drug war has already done to our communities. Yep. So, like for me, I know so many people who have gone to jail for drugs. As a matter of fact, my brother got arrested last week for possession of marijuana and cocaine, and his white friend was in the car with him, and his white friend did not get arrested. So, right, there's so much damage being done. I'm so used to having cops follow me in my hometown for whatever reason and pulling me over and you know so we can do decriminalization we can do legalization but we also need a, a reparative like component to these policies right like we can't just legalize things and act like nothing happened like there wasn't any harm done so i think that's something we should explore good great i, I agree it's not oh about God, modifying so the substances <laughs> It's about, like for me personally, it's a total rainbow hippie utopia thing about horizontal, circular, symbiotic, synergetic social models, mm. which means horizontal, not vertical, not diagonal. No one is above, no one is on top. It means circular. It means everyone is included. Everyone is facing the same center. Uh, symbiotic means a win-win. So everyone who is linked to that social system has a benefit from it and is benefiting the system. And synergetic means it's amplifying each <coughs> one of the individual elements uh, and individuals. And I think that psychedelics is the way there, and it has been the way towards that in the sense of the uh, still living uh, religions around the plants, the still living churches, the Wirrarica, the Huichol, uh, the Peyote, Native American church, the ayahuasca churches, before they were signed as the Santo Daime, or, you know? Uh, so, so these paths, these institutions point towards the center, use the medicine in a collective way, in a tribal, shamanic, horizontal, circular way. Uh, and they're just pointers to what can be a social model that we can work towards. And it's just recognizing the discrepancy, the systems that we have, the values that we have. And that understanding, as they have said before, is there in the plants, has been there in the plants, and is there in the direct experience that these things enable. You might call that a decentralized system. Exactly. And th that's why we're getting near to the cross intersection about crypto anarchism <laughs> and psychedelics. <laughs> I just want to say one you know, thing about funding. I thought that was a great point, Catherine. So, you know, one of the, the things that I, I am very worried about, right, is funding, right? And so how do we, if we need to fix this problem of funding, the simplest answer to me is mass engagement. And if we're going to engage the masses, right, we have to really be creative in how we're going to do that because I can't get, you know, a low-income person of color to understand the importance of voting for that elected official that is speaking for the decriminalization or the legalization of substances when they can't buy food. You know, when I have to think on the way here, am I going to pay for my cab or am I going to have a drink? I can't. You know, like we can't um, engage those people, but we have to engage them because they are the rising American electorate. In 30 years, the voting population in the United States is going to be Latino, right? We're talking about mass engagement of the world. We need to figure out how to change the language in a way that we can really access everybody because I promise that if we can talk to many, many people, we're going to find the solution for the lack of funding. People will give if they know that this also works for them. We got to figure that part out. So um, one of the, I just want to draw attention to the importance of the space that this conversation is holding. One of the things that uh, Dennis said in the last panel, um, or thinking <coughs> about like the nuance of like what we're doing here, uh, and it was like I think I think what he said was that like the medicine is the teacher, right? We don't, we can't see where we're going. We we don't know where we're going. And although I think that's true, I want to add something to that. I think although we maybe don't clearly know exactly where we're going. If we don't talk about it and figure out where we're going, then somebody else will do it for us. And we've had that, we've been in that position of responding, of reactivity for decades, centuries, longer. And I think that part of the opportunity that we have to move this conversation forward is in talking about these things that make a lot of people really uncomfortable because just like psychedelic therapy or psychedelic healing, they force us to confront things that we don't want to deal with, that we've avoided dealing with successfully for some people for a really long time in a way that has placed so much of that burden on others. Can, can I add something to that? Absolutely, yeah. Well, we want to keep that conversation going, and that doesn't necessarily even mean we have to know the answers, mm -hmm. but we just have to start asking the right questions. 
And that's, uh, I mean, that was a big part of the inspiration of this event. People have been asking, like, well, what is, what's the intersection of crypto and psychedelics? And I said, well, that's why we're here. We're here to find that out. We're here to ask that question. I also want to, so I want to uh, prompt uh, this idea that a lot of us here are familiar with. Uh, can you please raise your hand if you've heard of the phrase set and setting? Okay, that's a pretty, pretty solid majority. Not everybody, but very close. Um, so as was mentioned in the last panel, and just very briefly, the, the general concept behind set and setting is fairly simple, that when you engage with an experience that brings you to an altered state, especially a psychedelic, being aware of the set and setting and the dose, what you're taking, um, has a tremendous impact on the ultimate experience. Set, mindset, where's your head at? What's your, like, what's your emotional state? How are you feeling at the time? Setting, where are you? And I think one of the ways we can engage this conversation in the broader community is thinking about how set and setting in those terms is actually quite limiting. Mm. And that we should expand what we understand to, to mean set and setting. And by, by expanding that understanding, we'll have a better way of responding to the humongous diversity of issues that we're actually trying to confront here. So for example, the issue that I think Nishay mentioned uh, on the last panel of inter intergenerational intersectional trauma. We're learning a lot about epigenetic trauma right now and how trauma is carried through populations that have experienced extreme trauma in, in really high levels over the course of time. I think that conversations around long-term trauma and that experience is part of the conversation of set. Your mindset is not just how you're feeling today, like how did you wake up, did you have coffee, like are you feeling like you can take some acid? It's where do you come from and what's the, what's the relationship between your experience to your ancestry and the, thing, the way things are working. And similarly, setting, setting where you are, where we are, isn't just like the physical location we are, like this amazing space right now. By the way, thank you, Symposia. Thank you, Decentranet. Shout out to the organizers. But it's also the setting, the cultural and political setting that we're in, the laws that affect us, who the laws affect. The setting is not just a function of the location, it's the system that the location exists within. So I just want to throw that idea out there and see if, if the panel has any thoughts around like how we can expand how we do psychedelics, how we think about how they're done in a way that brings in these larger themes. So I, I, I just would say that uh, for me, a nice thing I learned uh, a little while ago um, uh, while interviewing someone um, was that, for example, during the 60s, there was this, uh, it was also mentioned here, there was this naive approach to what the psychedelic culture, counterculture, could bring. So it was a counterculture because it was determined to step outside of mainstream platform of culture, of economy, or whatever. And it, it, it self-labeled itself in an antagonistic position as the counterculture. But then it was so naive that it was about decorating your cars. So it was painting flowers and rainbows in the cars. So then every cop would know where to find grass, right? That was the easy way to stop that revolution, that everyone was just pinpointing themselves about, hey, yeah, I'm doing drugs, I'm different, you know? I'm good, I'm cool, I'm hip. So that was a very naive approach to countercultural revolution in the sense of how to destabilize the structures, the system, the economy. And still it was a major threat. And that's what we were mentioning. That's why from 1961, where cannabis and coca leaf and poppy heroin uh, was made illegal, it was until 1971 that DMT, LSD, MDMA, methamphetamine, and every other psychoactive drug that we know here now about the black market was made illegal. So it took 10 years of social revolt and uh, intellectual kind of uh, path forming around the use of these substances without international control for them to all be put together in 10 years to a list where the international infrastructure, which means the United Nations, the International Narcotics Control Board, this, the Commission of Narcotic Bo uh, Drugs, in supposed uh, advice from the World Health Organization, decided that all of these hundreds of substances that were linked to social movements, that were linked to student movements, that were linked to the countercultural movements that were being a threat to the mainstream economy in the 1969-1970 period, uh, became illegal, all of them, at the same time. And that's what we're dealing with. All of these substances, regardless of them having thousands of years of use of tradition in indigenous practice, religious systems, having cultural models built for hundreds or thousands of years in their safe use as medicine, including opiates, including every potential medicinal sacred herb and plant, we pretend now to bring Western medicine there because we assume it's necessary, because we are 
clinging to our platform. We're not listening to the wisdom that is there. We're not listening to the knowledge, to the learning. We are trying to blend our sinking capitalist uh, exploitatory system to what we are romantically portraying as the truth that lies in these very eroded indigenous practices, talking just out of Mexico, you know, like seeing traditions, indigenous traditions here in Mexico. It's not about crystal castles of knowledge. They're drinking Coca-Cola during their ceremonies. They're, you know, feeding Coca-Cola to their babies because there's no water or milk in the communities. And, and that's part of the medicine. So, you know, peyote tastes better with Coca-Cola. Uh, is that a good thing to look, you know, is that a poetic uh, pedestal that we, uh, that we want as a reference for the new age of shamanic psychiatry? I don't know, you know, like I think about psychiatry and it's about defining the normal, what's normal and whatever is not normal, we need to medicalize it. So I would just throw out there as a reflection, you know, what's the normal? Do we want psychiatry to be the main guideline about our psychedelic renaissance and our interaction with these molecules? Do we want a medicalized, clinical, pathologizing perspective? Or do we want a bottom-up, grassroots, community-based, inclusive, circular, horizontal, symbiotic, synergetic perspective? Thank you, Ren. And I, I just want to say that in terms of like what Izzy asked about, you know, how conceptualizing set and setting, like how do we change that? Um, at least for me, I know, I've always known the importance of storytelling. Symposia is so, so um, wonderful um, in understanding that, right? And so my thing is like my simple way of doing it, and I hope this trickles down, is um, speaking up and speaking out and um, like coming out all the time about the fact that I'm a psychedelic user, I'm a survivor of intergenerational trauma, you know, I mean, speaking about it, it's, it's hard, but, but speaking about it, right, so that um, that changes the stigmati stigmatization of, of the conversation. Um, and I don't want to have to think that I can't do underground psychedelic therapy and run for office. That sucks. Like, if I want to run for office, I can't do that at the same time. And so I constantly feel like I, you know, I have to pick between one or the other. And so changing, I think, the narrative and, and making the conversation um, something that every, you know, I'm a human and I use psychedelics, a bunch of people do it too. Making that a, a normal thing, normalizing that, is the way that I can impact that change on a micro level and I hope that that moves on in a macro level. Yeah, we need more politicians coming out of the psychedelic closet, actually. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I think we need to take back the words too, take back our own language. Psychedelic is not a bad word. Yeah. People are saying to me, oh, why are you being so blatant by the name of this event, crypto psychedelic? <laughs> because psychedelic's not a bad word to me. Psychedelic's a good word, or can be good. It's, it, it comes back to set and setting. What is the intention? Crypto, for that matter too, isn't necessarily good and gonna fix everything, but what's the intention? What's the set and setting? And those are the questions we should be asking. This isn't about, oh, these are gonna save the world just by existing, but how are we using these tools? And, and I think this all comes back, you know, I want to bounce back on this question of the medicalization, which I think all of us would support, are supporting all of the research happening wholeheartedly. That said, we don't think that that system should have the monopoly and be the sole system that controls it can be. It can psychedelics. Be. It can be. We, we, can't, we can't reduce the issues that we're dealing with to that model. And I, we, I heard that acknowledgement in the last panel. You know, we all know it. It's not that there is like the fight, but we have to make sure that those other options, we have a lot of space, the conversation around how, how we will medicalize is fairly articulated. It's amazing how much progress has been made in the last couple of decades, and God willing, how much will be, will be made, inshallah, in the next few years. And I think that that is really powerful and really magical, but there's a lot more. I actually would like to ask Ife to speak a little bit to, um, you know, a lot of the psychedelic movement has tried to distance itself from the drug war, and this is something you've spoken about, and uh, I, I just love your thoughts around this whole subject. I think it's, I think it's really important for us to consider like, the implications of like, the medical, medicalization, right? Especially the medical system in the US is like, rooted in like, a lot of, I'm just gonna say it's like, rooted in racism. Like our medical system is really like, fucked up in America, right? Like, so, if you, I studied history in college, so that's my academic background, and part of that is really like understanding the context that we live in, right? Like, I'm a black American person, and my ancestors were enslaved, and enslaved people were experimented on for medical research purposes. Like, the father of gynecology, J. Marion Sims, he experimented on enslaved 
African women with no like anesthesia or anything, right? So you have to really consider like how that manifests today in our medical system and like our healthcare is just like uh, a wormhole. And if you're poor, if you're black, you can expect, oh, sorry. If you're poor, if you're black, if you're a person of color, if you have undocumented status, you can expect to be treated poorly by like doctors, nurses, et cetera. Um, in terms of like, the drug war, I feel like in the psychedelic community, there's this like hesitancy to really be political about what we're talking um, on psychedelic, psychedelic use, and why the psychedelic community, when we come into these spaces, it's like the same people everywhere, and like what barriers are up that stops people like me from being here and present. Right, so there's things like money, there's the criminalization, there's the stigma, there's so many barriers. And by not talking about it, by not talking about how there's a lack of people of color in these spaces, we make the problem worse. So, yeah. Betty, could you add on to that? Because you have yeah, such a good perspective I, as well. You know, it's interesting to me that um, everyone saw the study that came out somewhat recently that said that uh, using mushrooms, using psilocybin, makes a person uh, more likely to be environmentally inclined. Did we see this one? Yeah. So like, eating mushrooms is going to make us care more about the trees, but somehow seems to not impact our feelings about people locked in cages. <laughs> and that's really distressing to me. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's uh, an, you know, an incredible opportunity. Psychedelics, my personal use of psychedelics has uh, expanded what was already a pretty big capacity for empathy within me and has made me feel more connected to and concerned about the people around me. And I say this as a person who spent my entire life dedicated to like, the notion of making the world a better place, right? And there's a, there seems to be a, a willingness in the psychedelic community, the psychedelic use community, not reform community, to um, so ig ignore <coughs> um, the socio-cultural realities that are uh, creating extraordinary barriers to use for the people who are perhaps most traumatized, who could benefit yep. most from the use of these substances. Um, please forgive me, I'm overcoming illness, and so I had to step away for a moment. Uh, got a little overheated up here, but uh, I'm sure that you all have spoken about um, you know, the trauma of racism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, simply being black or brown or female in the world right now can be an incredibly traumatic experience. And more and more research is demonstrating that just being, growing up black in America can cause PTSD. That's it, just growing up black in America. And so um, if, we're, if we're not paying attention to the legal status of these drugs and simply promoting them as, uh, you know, for use to those who feel comfortable enough to use them, um, then we're really missing out. We're doing a great disservice to the world, and I'd like for us to focus our attention more on the legal status and not just use our privilege mm -hmm. to continue to be able to use these substances without much fear of, of, of you know, the criminal justice system. Yes, I'd like to add to that also. Um, yeah, we're talking about psychedelics for healing trauma, but if we're ignoring the most marginalized populations, then we're really missing the mark. Yep. And deeper than that, what's better than healing trauma is stopping the trauma from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yes. So we have to talk about this. Um, and, I, and, and as far as privilege goes, I think um, there's an aspect of privilege. Actually, I'm going to borrow some of ideas from Natalie, who's somewhere around here, that <laughs> if you're in a position of privilege, someone like myself, we can use that and create space. Uh, for others, and I think that's an important role. Let's recognize where we are uh, and make that space. And if it feels, you know, if it feels too distant, right? So if it feels like, how am I going to, you know, to me, dismantling racism is like such an overwhelming, enormous task. Like, how on earth am I going to do that? It's not going to happen in my lifetime. I think it starts with what Mike said, is being aware um, and intentional about creating space for marginalized communities, marginalized people, creating that space. Um, and, and um, 
Yeah, for a long time, I, I was a psychedelic user that had no idea the importance about the, it's really embarrassing about cr decriminalizing drugs. Like, I just, like, didn't understand it. And now I, I, I do, and I cannot imagine advocating for MDMA without talking about the criminal justice system. And when I was, when talking back about privilege, when I was telling my, my supervisor that I had to go away this weekend, uh, it was really hard to be like, yeah, I got to go to Mexico to a conference on psychedelics and cryptocurrency <laughs> because I know that the first thing she probably was thinking was, wait, so I'm leaving my, wor my, really, my work that I'm doing in the community to go you know, be with a bunch of privileged people and enjoy the sun and talk about how we can all do drugs more. And I had to really sit and think about how I'm gonna have that conversation with her and explain to her that maybe that'd be, that's so, but I'm also there to like create conversation, create space, bring awareness to the table with, you know, with, with my family here and to, dis to, to not stigmatize the beautiful community that we are, we have to be really intentional about um, bringing different voices to the table. I, I think right before uh, our, our talk started, Boone had some amazing words um, about how psychedelics can't just be um, an accessory or like an aesthetic choice on the society we're already, already building. It has to melt society. It has to really give, give us something to start from. Um, and I really want to bring in what uh, Dr. Tufour brought in, in the last talk about how uh, we're not waiting for the state to drive culture. I thought that was a great quote, yeah. and I thought it was amazing because we're not waiting for the state to drive culture. I want to really, really bring that in the ground and, um, and flip that to what also he said, which is that family and community drive structure. And there's this overlap between psychedelic healing and therapy and the family systems. Dennis mentioned it. Joe mentioned it. You know, everyone's kind of talking about the family systems, the communities that these work in. But we do still, and I'm, I'm, I acknowledge that I'm speaking from a very US-centric perspective today and right now, um, coming from this hyper-individualistic understanding of like how things should be done. And I think that hyper-individualism has created some incredible growth, incredible progress in some ways for human history. But I think that if we don't have an awareness of what family and community is and what it means in its entirety, not just in the version that we're given by the superstructure, then we can have some space to envision, really envision, without those blinders of privilege of the superstructure, these blinders that are imposed upon us and create something really big. So for cl final thoughts, for closing thoughts, like how do we, what's the advocacy, right? Advocacy, family, community structures, what's the relationship between these things and how do we lock that into our society for a long-term, for some long-term vision? Yeah, I wanna just, riff off exactly what you were saying. You're talking about, so we have a very highly individualized society, and now we see this shift back into community, into decentralization. Um, so then there's the next question of what's beyond decentralization. Is individualism decentralization? I wonder. Yeah, well, I, I guess to me when it comes to what, what is the role of leadership, right? In what, if it's not hierarchical, if it's not giving orders to people, telling you what you can and cannot do, what does leadership look like? And uh, I think that it, what it means is it's empowering other people. And I think that's what, in, in the post-decentralization world, that's where, that's where we keep move this movement going. Uh, I think it's really important for us and everyone here to use our varying degrees of privilege to give back to where we came from. And I think it's important for us, you know, when we do have this knowledge, it doesn't do any good for us to just keep it to ourselves. That's what I mean by gatekeeper. And empowering people is like bringing them into the movement wherever they are, meeting the people where they are. And going back to that, I mean, piggybacking on that, I, I see it, like I said earlier, about intentional leadership development. It's about hearing somebody on a panel or two or three or a conversation and uh, going up to them and, and continuing that conversation. If you are somebody that has the means to further this work, making sure that you are um, speaking to all different types of people and getting their perspective, because we have some great ideas, um, <laughs> I promise. Um, some of us have business plans laid out, so, you know, I mean, really. Uh, and I, so I think empowerment means intentional leadership. Um, I want to know that I can count on uh, people that don't look like me to move me into these spaces. This is the first time that I feel like that in seven years of being in this community. Um, let's make sure that we continue that. One of the things that's most exciting to me about my work at Students for Sensible Drug Policy is that my job is very rarely to sit on panels like this, but far more frequently to make sure that there's a student here. Um, so that people are speaking from their own voices and don't require me to represent them. And I think that one of the most powerful pieces of work that 
those of us in privilege can do is help people hone and perfect their messages so that they're able to deliver, regardless of, of their uh, social standing, they're able to deliver those messages themselves. And I think that there's um, exceptional opportunity in this community uh, full of you know, weirdos and uh, to uh, you know, get, spread the messages, spread the people who are able to speak and, and uh, empower more voices. I hope that we see more and more of that. But in particular, like Oriana said, uh, not just the people who we expect to be speaking. Sure, we have to break through, um, oftentimes and unfortunately have to break through initial uh, notions of, of normalcy with people who look like, uh, who look like us. Um, but ultimately, the idea is that everybody is able to lift up their voice, and I think that that's uh, one of the most important things that we can do in a space like this. Um, I just would like to say two quick things. I kind of differ a little bit from this notion that family drives culture. I would say that media drives culture right now. And so that's why we need to be very acute and very smart on the messages and the portrayal we have on media about these topics, issues, and messages. And on the other side, for me, it's easy to understand like all this thing about the war on drugs as uh, spiritual oppression. <laughs> Every part of the barriers that we have are part of this system that is repressing sexuality, that is repressing consciousness, that is repressing the knowledge of the plants. And you know, it's the same system that was burning people for knowing what plants to use, you know, to heal something and not depending on what was then a uh, uh, theocratic state. You know, it was this, uh, now the state has the same values, the same morals as the witch hunt, uh, inquisition basically. They're separated, so they're diminishing spiritual, symbolic thinking. They're rejecting it as superstition. They're based in science, and they're using the arguments that are based in this approach of pathologizing, medicalized notion about what is normal and what is desirable to say every other thing is not acceptable and we don't want it. So for me, the vision is psychedelics and crypto anarchism, cryptocurrency in the sense of decentralized, liberating, freedom-driven channels to enable action without mediation, without regulation, without supervision, without monitoring, is basically the same thing. It's like going away outside or around or within these structures, these power structures, these barriers, and enabling people to engage in interaction, human interaction, even if it's digital, <laughs> uh, with each other without any regulatory measuring mediation body <coughs> entity. And so that it's just going back to basics, right? Going back to human engagement, human interaction, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, even if it's digital, again, uh, it's just moving to this other realm, but it's the same tendency that we need to uh, work everyone towards to, to escape this cage, the system, the cage that is uh, entrapping us, entrapping us and not exploring, not allowing us to explore our bodies, not allowing us to explore our energies, not allowing us to explore empathy and connection and keeping us frightened and keeping us hostile and keeping us isolated. So that's what we need to address. That's for me what psychedelics do. They enable us to see that, to work with that within ourselves. They enable us to bring that to others. And for me, that's what the uh, crypto uh, anarchy, anarchic potential of these opportunities has, that it's a liberating uh, pathway for human interaction without barriers, borders, limitations, mediators, regulations, and overview and supervision. So I want to close by just acknowledging a couple, one thing. Um, maybe you came to this panel thinking you were going get, to get a bunch of like practical things that you can do to advocate for psychedelics. I hope that you got some of them. I'm sure some of you are like, wow, that was like a whole bunch of like social political context. I did not anticipate being part of this effing conversation. I don't know if I like that or not. That's okay. Examine that. Spend some time with that. And I just want to say that whether or not you're having an incredible experience, whether you're experiencing some of that internal tension, whether you're not, if you're interested in engaging with this, talk to us. There are lots of advocates here doing incredible work, work that's absolutely transformative on a personal, individual, psycho-spiritual, social level, on a cultural level. We are doing it. There are people that are here in our presence. If you want ideas, talk to us.
there are lots of things happening. There, there's legislative change, there are initiatives, there are, there are literal global political changes happening in the United States, in Mexico, around the world, today, right now. You can be part of them, we are all already part of them. Make your participation consensual, bring yourself into it, bring your whole self into it, and let's go forward together. Can we please thank the panelists, they're amazing, y'all did a great job. Woo!